Hello, Sid Roth here, and I'm speaking to a young man by the name of Philip Renner. And uh, many of you are familiar with with his father, Rick Renner. He's, he's, as far as I'm concerned, one of the top Bible teachers in the world. But uh, I want to introduce you to his son. And uh, I, we were having some small talk before we went on the air, Philip, and uh, you were— would you say six years old when your fam- family hijacked you and took you to the former Soviet Union? Uh, and uh, so you you barely had time to be an American. Uh, why did they go to Russia? Well, my father, he felt the calling to go to the former Soviet Union and really bring the word of God, a strong word to the Russian people because there was no teaching. And that is when my father received his calling from the Lord, said, you have to go. I've called other people to go, but you have to go because there's a strong foundation of the word that they need to stand against trials and difficulty. They needed strong teaching. Uh, You made a statement that grabbed my attention, uh, that you experience miracles every day. Uh, That's not typical. It should be, but it's not typical. Was it just because you were in the Soviet Union, or was it because you've hooked up to some supernatural principles that are available to everyone? Well, I believe it's both, but honestly, it doesn't have to be just in the Soviet Union. I see God do things every single day in America as well, but I can remember the hunger, the hunger of the people in Russia when we started the program. I actually remember how we would have letter opening parties and we would go to the office and the letters would flood in from television. And there would be so many letters that I can remember me as a six year old. I would open the door and I would jump into the letters and literally swim through them because it was like a kiddie pool. There were so many letters, and they were all of people getting saved, healed, delivered. I mean, God was do, just doing amazing things in the former Soviet Union in Latvia at that time. And you told me your mom uh, was a worship leader, and you, you decided to be a worship leader. And you do that today, and the thing that is so overwhelming to me, again, Uh, you said it just before we went on the air, is you purposely go to places where it's illegal to have an outdoor concert. Now, why would you go to a place like that? Come on now. Didn't your parents raise you better? (laughs) (laughs) You know, when my father first heard that I was going to go to Chicago in the middle of the pandemic and set up a big worship event right in front of the mayor's office, He said to me, he said, Philip, you better have a word from God. This better not be your idea. This better be a God idea. If you were my my son, I would have said a little stronger, but go ahead. (laughs) But, you know, we had a word from the Lord. Honestly, the revelation that that comes from is from Gideon. The story of Gideon, Judges chapter 6. Before the army came together to take out the Midianites, God told him, I need you to go to the center of the city, and I need you to take down the idol. I need you to take down the stronghold. And whether we believe it or not, there are strongholds in our cities. And I believe that when we bring worship to the center of the city, we establish the government of God in that city. And it was amazing in Chicago because we had we had Satanists that would try to cross the street and physically there was nothing stopping them. Now, we set up in the midst of three riots specifically. I knew that it was going to be crazy. I had pastors telling me, Philip, you are crazy. What are you doing? And I simply said, you know, Psalm 512 says favor surrounds me like a shield and so i believe that favor surrounded us like a shield because satanists 
they could not cross the street. There was nothing physically that could stop them from crossing the street. But the moment they tried to cross the street to curse us, they hit something. They hit a bloodline because we had taken communion the day before and they could not pass that bloodline. It was wonderful to see the way God moved that day. Uh, I'm going to ask you two questions because your parents are amazing examples of what believers should do with their lives. Let's start with your dad, Rick Renner. Tell me one thing you learned from your dad that comes to mind. Uh, I was going to say the most important thing, but that'd be too hard for you, I think. One thing that'll help us that you were taught through observing or listening to your dad. You know, my dad always said, walk with God, listen to his voice and listen to what he tells you to do and do it and don't do anything else. Just be faithful in that one thing. And if you're faithful and little, God will give you much, whether it's cleaning the toilets or database or preaching or whatever it is, no matter how great or or small it is, you be faithful with that one thing, and God will move you forward. Okay, You're, more people know your dad than your mom, but another hero in your life is your mom. Tell me one thing she taught you that is significant. My mom always said, Philip, you're a leader. You are a leader, it doesn't matter what you feel, you're a leader and God is watching you. He's taking care of you. But something that was so significant to me that my mom taught was, was really fasting and praying. How old were you the first time you fasted and prayed? Very first time, do you remember? The first time I fasted and prayed, I believe I was 14 years old. And for me, it was very strange because I had seen my mom fast and pray. And I thought the fasting and praying was for the super spiritual people. It wasn't for little Philip Renner. But I remember I was just listening to the Lord one day and I heard him say, fast and pray. There was no reason. He just said, I want you to do that strange thing that your mom does. I want you to fast and pray. And I fasted for a week on liquids. And uh, I didn't know why I was fasting. But after the fast, my mom calls me and she says, Philip, you're in Latvia right now. Uh, we're in America. But a miracle happened. And I think it's because you fasted and prayed. And I said, Mom, what happened? She said, well, Dad didn't know how to tell people that we were moving from Latvia to Russia. And it didn't seem like he had the courage to do so. But something came on him in this meeting. It was courage. And he spoke the word of God. And it really propelled us into the next phase of our ministry as a family. And she said, Philip, I don't even think you realize it, but you changed the destiny of our family through fasting and praying. And from that day on, I understood that fasting and praying is, a, I guess you could say, the best kept secret in the Christian world that I believe that everyone should experience. Well, if it's the best kept secret, why in the world are people, I'm going to say it for what it is, fasting's okay for Philip, but not for me. Why, why don't they get those spectacular results every time they fast? Um, what would you say to people viewing us right now that would be the carrot to get us to fast. I know one thing I read that you wrote, and you said every single new chapter in your life was birth through a fast. That's absolutely true. You see, I believe that fasting is from the Hebrew word som, which means 
to cover your mouth for 24 hours, to shut your mouth for 24 hours. And instead of fellowshipping, you're praying. Instead of eating, you're praying. A lot of people, when they say, I'm going to fast, they're not praying. They're just going through starvation. And starvation is not fasting. Fasting is instead of spending time with people, instead of eating at the dinner table, you spend that time and you humble yourself before God. And the Bible is very clear through so many stories. I mean, Jesus, he couldn't start his ministry until he fasted for 40 days. Now, if Jesus could not start his ministry without a fast, then how much more is it necessary for us to fast and pray, to humble ourselves before God? And the Bible is very clear that when we humble ourselves before God, he will heal our land. Let me ask you about a uh, one of the first fasts you were involved in, and it had to do with your youth worship group or your youth group. Well, honestly, the youth ministry was not doing good at all. I had 30 people in the youth ministry, 15 of which gossiped against me and did not like my preaching. <laughs> it was not the greatest situation. In fact, they laughed at my preaching. They said, we got to get a different preacher. Uh, he's a good singer. We can leave him as a singer, but we got to get a different preacher because his endings Russian are all off. In fact, one time I was preaching in Russian, and the word thorn in Russian is zhala, but the word frog in Russian is zhaba. <laughs> and when I spoke, I said, Paul didn't have a thorn in his flesh. I said he had a frog in his flesh. It's just one letter, but it makes a whole world of difference. And so the youth didn't remember my messages. They re remembered how I messed up. And there was gossiping. And, you know, we got to get a different preacher because this is the laughing stock of all the youth ministries of Russia right here. And it, it really hurt my heart. So I began to fast and pray and seek the Lord. And I had fasted for one week, then for two weeks. And then, honestly, they just thought I was a weird youth pastor that wouldn't eat. So things were getting worse. But I said, Lord, I'm ready to give up. What do you want me to do? And he said, Philip, I want you to fast for 40 days. And I said, Lord, no, no, I will not fast for 40 days. Elijah did that. Jesus did that. Joshua did that on the mountain with Moses, but no, 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 not little Philip Renner. And I said, I'm going to go home and I'm going to talk to my wife. And if she says that this is from the Lord, then it's going to happen. And so I go home believing that she is going to say, no, 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 you have to have a strong body. But she said, you've already fasted for two days. How much harder could seven weeks be? <laughs> <laughs> But there was supernatural growth in the youth ministry. In fact, we went from 30 people to 150 people in one service because we had called on the Lord. We had gotten a strategy from God, and it was very powerful. But not only that, it wasn't 15 people that were gossiping against me and were speaking against me. It was two people that were rousing everybody up. And because of the fasting and the praying, God revealed the root of the situation and they removed themselves from the youth ministry. I didn't remove them. They removed themselves from the youth ministry. And because of that, holiness came and restoration came. And I, I saw revival and I saw people restored because the Lord said, fast and pray. What well, you say in your book, you point this out, that many people have a misunderstanding of what fasting is for. You mentioned one thing, it's not to lose weight or, or to go on a right. diet. But what, uh, in those, what I found is my expectation when I first got into fasting was all wrong. 
my expectation is every time I fast, I will hear the audible voice of God. I mean, you can laugh at me, but that was my expectation. And guess what? It didn't happen. Nope. Nope. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. You know, sometimes there are times in a fast where it just, it just feels like a desert. You're hungry. Your flesh is screaming. But even in a desert, there is so much water underneath the sand. And in those days, all you have to do is you have to dig a little deeper. And when you dig a little deeper, you're going to get that revelation that God wants to give you. The best messages, the best songs, the best strategies, and the best breakthroughs that I have ever received generally are not during a fast, but they are after a fast. Uh, You know, we're putting two books of yours together and because they're so related, and we're making it what's known as an electronic book so you can get it instantly anywhere in the world. And we'll make it available shortly. But uh, the first book is obviously a fasted life. What is a fasted life to you? You know, I think that some people think that, you know, you fast and the miracle takes place and that's it. But a fast is not a one time fix. A fast is life transformation. And when you fast and pray, you have to fast with the right motive. Some people are just fasting for a miracle. And you're going to get the miracle. You're going to receive what God wants to give to you. But when you fast for God's heart, that's when you get real life transformation. And let me give you this example. I can remember when a friend called me and I had not talked to that friend for a long time. And he called me, said, let's go get some coffee. And I went and I got some coffee with him. And it turns out he didn't want to spend time with me. All he wanted was my money. All he wanted was something that I could give to him. And honestly, what I felt was being I felt like I was being used and abused. And sometimes I think we look at fasting like it's a slot machine in heaven. Like, oh, I'm going to fast and I'm going to get a miracle. Yeah, you're going to get your miracle. But if all your fasting is for a miracle, you're going to miss the biggest part, which is life transformation. Because after a fast, it doesn't just give you the miracle. It changes your heart. It what it does is it it starves your unbelief. It aligns you with God. Fasting never moves God, but fasting moves you. And when you are moved into the perfect alignment of God's will, that's when you can expect God move. The way I put it in my book is as I say, don't fast for God's hand fast for his heart. But when you touch his heart, his hand is going to move your direction. Well, there's so so many things that have happened to you and your family through living a fasted life. One time, it looks to me like you literally saved your daughter's life. There was a time, there was a year where the Lord would say, it's time to fast. And I'd be like, Lord, I don't want to fast. I want to eat a steak today, actually. (laughs) And he'd say, no, it's time to fast. I wouldn't know why. There were several 40-day fasts that year, a couple of 21-day fasts that year. It seemed like I was fasting every other day of the year. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what is this all about? Why are you telling me to fast so much? And he said to me, he said, Philip, you don't realize it. But there are barriers that are in front of you. There are obstacles that are in front of you. And when you fast and pray, when you fast and pray, you break those obstacles before you ever get to them. And I remember one day I woke up in the 
it was a Sunday morning and it was one of those days I really wanted to eat. And he said, it's time to fast. And the whole day I was wrestling. The whole day I had people say, Philip, would you like me to take you to lunch? I believe that God wants me to bless you today. <laughs> and I was like, no, thank you. We can do it another day. But I even almost broke the fast. But the Lord said, do not break the fast. And at rehearsal, I was leading worship. And uh, at rehearsal, I had somebody walk up to me and they said, Philip, your daughter is blue right now. She swallowed a cookie. And this is the first time that this has happened in 12 years in the kids' ministry. We don't understand what's going on. And you really need to come to her. But I heard the Lord say, you don't even need to come. It's all taken care of. And immediately I knew why I was fasting. I knew that it was to protect my family. And I actually told the girl, I said, it'll be fine. And she looked at me like I was the worst father on the planet. <laughs> I said in about, you know, a minute or so, she'll be fine. She walked up, checked her out, and she spit out the cookie. She became absolutely normal. And, and her life was saved. She came back and said, you won't believe it. She's absolutely fine. I said, I believe it. Fasting protects you. It's a shield of favor around your life. C can I share one more story? Because Please. my family was literally saved through fasting and praying. Please. It was through a season of a fasted life. I remember how we came to the United States and I left my daughter in Russia with her grandmother and me and my wife, we came to the United States. When we got in the car, uh, we were driving home. It's about 12 a.m. at night. We haven't slept for about 27 hours. <laughs> and the craziest thing happened. We ran over a mattress on the highway. And I try to get the mattress from out from underneath the car. But what I realized is the coils in the mattress have gotten stuck in the engine of the car. Oh, awful. We get it. We leave all of our stuff in the car, and uh, and because the keys were the kind of keys that you left the car, the car would block itself. We're calling, you know, whoever we need to call to, to fix the car. It's almost 1 a.m. in the morning, and I decide I'm going to check the car one more time. Well, I checked the car one more time, and I realized that smoke and fire is underneath the car. We start running the other direction and we literally watch our car explode. And I say, Lord, this is not what I have asked of you. What is going on? Our passports are in there. Our clothes are in there. My computer is in there. My life is in there. But in that moment, my wife's crying. She's hugging me. She's saying, Philip, how are we going to get back to Russia? How are we going to get back to our, our daughter? We're stuck here in, in America right now. And I literally lifted my hands and I said, babe, if we lose everything today, we have lost nothing because we have Jesus. And I believe that I would not have said that if there wasn't fasting and praying and an understanding of consecration on the inside. And the end of the story is that the fireman came, he checked out the car, and our passports were completely intact. My computer, I lost nothing in my computer. The Bible that we had in the car was absolutely untouched by the flames. In fact, if you walk into my apartment today, you're going to find that, that Bible untouched by the flames because the word will go through the fire, but it will never be burned. If, if someone's listening to us and they say, well, you know, I haven't really given fasting a fair effort because my expectation was so wrong. My purpose was so wrong. I'm beginning to see that right now. 
but I've to- I've been told don't go on a 40-day fast if God himself hasn't told you to. Just take a day or two. What do you recommend? Well, I would tell them that I never started with the 40-day fast, and you should never start with a 40-day fast until God tells you to do so. But even when God told me to do so, I started with a one-day fast, then a three-day, then a seven, then a 14. And it's something that you slowly prepare your body to do so. And a lot of people don't do it because they think, oh, man, this is this is horrible. <laughs> you, you can feel headaches and dizziness and everything going on. But the key to hunger, sorry, the key to revival is hunger. And when you hunger for God and when you say, God, instead of eating, I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to seek you. You are going to see revival, but it is a process. It's a process. And when your head is spinning and your stomach is hurting, it's actually all the junk that you eat is coming out and you're actually pretty healthy. You just got to wait to the third, the fourth day and you realize that you really don't want to eat. It's all up here. It's all up here. You got cravings because honestly, food is fun. But it's in that moment, even when I feel pain on the inside, for me, that is a a sign that I need to shut my door and I need to go pray. And so many times when I go pray and I come out in a couple of hours, I feel like I have been fed and I get a revelation. And through that revelation, there's a breakthrough. And I'm going to say it again. Many times the miracle doesn't happen during the fast, but it does happen after the fast. Breakthrough and just a new transparency in your relationship with God. Now, we're offering two books, A Fasted Life and Worship Without Limits. I can't play an instrument, Philip. I don't hold a tune very well, Philip. What do you mean worship? Well, I would say that worship, worship is really what's going on in your heart. Worship is what we did when we saw our car in flames and everybody was telling us, your life is over. What we did is we lifted up our hands and we began to adore the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's not about playing worship. It's not about playing an instrument. In fact, there is only one word that describes worship in in actually playing an instrument, which is zamar, which means to prophetically prophesy on an instrument. But all the other words, tehillah, which means to shift the atmosphere. It means to speak the word of God. And as you speak the word of God, as you, you know, sometimes sing the word of God, lift your hands. It's a, it's an understanding of the heart. You worship and you adore him. And you just say, God, I love you. God, I adore you. You are my everything. That is worship. God doesn't care if you have the greatest voice and God doesn't care if you have the greatest talent. What God cares about is where is your heart in this situation? bowing down, lifting up your hands, lifting up a shout of praise. These are all things that you can do without worship. Worship is simply what you adore. Adore him with everything that you got. Philip, we've explained a lot of principles of fasting, a few of worship, why does anyone even need the two books? What, what benefit will we have to read these two books? Well, I believe that specifically in a fasted life, one, I believe it'll become a practice. It'll be not just something that you do. It'll be something that you carry. You'll feel the fire of God as you read these books. You'll be equipped to preach to other people, 
and your relationship with God will go to a new level. But something that I want to say about fasting is there's an interesting question that the disciples asked Jesus. Actually, John's disciples asked Jesus. They said, why don't your disciples fast? And Jesus replies, he says, well, basically, I'm here so they're not going to fast. The fullness of God is here right now. So there's no reason for the fast, than the fast. When they're gone, when I'm gone, you know, they're going to fast. But then he continues to answer the question. And he says, you can't pour new wine into old wineskins. That's a weird way to answer a question about fasting, except to understand that fasting turns you into a new wineskin. It turns you into a new wineskin so that you will be able to receive and to contain the new wine. The new thing that God wants you to do in this life. And really what I'm talking about is to contain the glory of God, but not just contain the glory of God, Release the glory of God wherever you are. Uh, you, you teach that fasting will increase God's glory in your container, if you will, in your body, faster than anything you, you can do. Well, here's what I know. I know it's something taught in the Bible. I know great men and women of God have done this throughout centuries. I know Philip is speaking from personal experience. And I know there's revelation for you. It's not all here. It's a revelation knowledge of what is worship, how to worship, what is fasting, how to fast. And you know something? If you just end up fasting one meal a day and spend that time in adoring God, it, 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 you will have a changed life, I believe. It's not, it, 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 it's not that 40 days. It's the heart. That's what God wants. It's the heart. And God, you know, God will call you to different fasts. There's the Daniel fast, the liquid fast, there's full fast, there's all different kinds of fasts. But what it is, is it's being humble before him. It's shutting the door and it's saying, God, I seek you first, your kingdom, and I love and adore you. And just like you say, it's the heart. When you say, I care about God more than food, then he blesses you. So, for an instant download of the two books, A Fasted Life and Worship Without Limits, just go to www.sidroth.org, O-R-G, slash Renner. Download the book. Philip, I want you to pray. You carry a miracle anointing. You carry the glory of God. You carry the glory of a worshiper. I believe it's time, although your books impart all of this, I want you to impart it to us right now. Father, I thank you for everyone watching right now. And I thank you that the power of God fills the room, Lord Jesus. I thank you that the miracle working power of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords comes into their home and shifts the atmosphere wherever they are. Father, I thank you that you strengthen them. I thank you that you refresh them. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you shock them with your glory, God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you bless them. I thank you that you spoil them, God. Spoil them and do something just like a loving father. Hug them right now in that room. Touch them with your unconditioning, unfailing love. And like a tsunami, 
just bring in the glory wherever they are in the name of Jesus. And may the glory of God rip out every root of bitterness, rip out every root of sin and release the fire of God in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your blood and we thank you that everything that we have asked for is already done through the power of the cross and the resurrection. Amen. That was a powerful prayer and an even more powerful word that you brought, Philip. I pray that people realize it wasn't just another teaching. It's a life changer. <laughs>